The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Welcome to Bronx Talk. Tonight we continue our mini series of the people who have won the Democratic primary that was held in June. And uh, this evening we will do the primary winners in the 15th, 16th, 17th, and 18th council districts in the Bronx. We'll do it in two segments. We'll start off um, with the incumbents, uh, two who are already in office and will be on the Democratic ballot. In November, of course, we presume nothing. Uh, I believe both of them will be challenged uh, in the um, uh, November election. But right now, let's uh, congratulate uh, Oswald Felice, the uh, council member in the 15th Council District, for his victory in the primary. Nice to have you with us, Councilman. Thank you for having me. I, I, I love to just mention, so people will be able to identify with the neighborhoods, the 15th District includes Bedford Park, Fordham, Mount Hope, Bathgate, Belmont, East Tremont, West Farms, Van Ness, Allerton, and Owenville. Neighborhoods I'm sure Councilmember Felice is quite familiar with. <laughs> and also, uh, let's uh, welcome uh, the longtime incumbent. Um, he did win the primary in the 17th Council District, which is Concourse Village, Cretona Park East, East Tremont, Hunts Point, Longwood, uh, Melrose, Marsania, Port Morris, West Farms, North and South Brother Islands. Uh, nice to see Councilmember Rafael Salamanca Jr. on Bronx Talk. Again, nice to have you with us, sir. Thank you. Let's start with you, um, uh, Councilmember uh, Felice. Let's see, you had, um, this was a quite a contentious uh, campaign. There were many candidates, but some of them well qualified. You ended up in round one with 38.2% and uh, then ultimately uh, carried the day after a ranked choice voting. What do you attribute uh, your support to and uh, your victory in the primary to? Yeah, thank you so much. Yes, an extremely competitive race, maybe one of the most competitive races in the entire city in 2021. Uh, we actually ended up with a very strong victory uh, in the March special election and also a much stronger victory uh, victory uh, for the June election. And I think that victory I attributed to many things, including my history and my work in the Bronx. I've spent my entire career, you know, as a tenant lawyer for the last three years, I've fought for our most vulnerable people, uh, people at risk of eviction. I've defended them in eviction cases, and I've also represented them in uh, cases where their landlord was harassing them, failing to make repairs. Um, also, as an educator, I've taught our most vulnerable students at a local community college right here in the Bronx. Uh, so I've spent my whole career right here in the Bronx giving back to the community, and I think that paid off. I, during the election, actually, uh, I remember a lot of uh, the voters telling me, Hey, Oswald, I have spoken to every single candidate, including uh, you, and there's nothing that any of them can do to convince me to vote for them. Uh, I've known you for a very long time, and I appreciate the work that you did for me and my neighbors, and you have my number one vote. Uh, you, so my work. Were you satisfied with the ranked choice voting process? I realize you're satisfied with the result because it worked out <laughs> for you. Um, do, do you think this is, it has shown to be a good process and something as a council member now you'd recommend the city pursue in the future? Uh, I have um, a mixed opinion, mixed feelings about it. I think, I think it sounds like a good process, but when you have a race like we had, an election like we had the June election, you had to vote for five candidates for mayor, five for comptroller, five for borough president, five for city council, and then judges. I think that could make voters extremely exhausted. So that would be one of your concerns is that voter education needs to be stronger uh, if we're going to continue with this process. Absolutely. And another thing is, which I'm actually, my office is in the process of writing a letter to the Board of Elections, is the design of the ballot. Um, it seems like they put all the races together 
And in one case, I'll see if I could bring the picture in a few minutes. Um, but they thought they were voting for me and they were actually, so my name was right here and my number one choice was, my number one line was here. They actually voted on the other side. So they put another candidate as their number five because there wasn't any line to distinguish a borough president and the city council race. Council member Salamanca, uh, congratulations to you for your uh, primary win. Um, talk to me about what you think you have brought to the table and why people said, you know, maybe we ought to bring this guy back. Well, Gary, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, you know, this 2021 election, to be quite frank, is my fourth primary uh, that I've had. I came in just like Oswald and special. Um, and, and then, you know, just the way the rules are. Um, you know, I've been fortunate enough, enough uh, to have the confidence of my constituents to, um, you know, to, to, to allow me another four years, well, another two years in the council. Um, you know, I'm born and raised in this community. Uh, yeah, I, I, I st my first job was in this community. Um, I was the former district manager for Bronx Community Board 2, covering Hunts Point and Longwood. And it was that time in the, in the community board that I learned how government actually works. You know, how to, how to break certain barriers, how to go through bureaucracy to bring true change to your community. And that position as a district manager really helped me and molded me. Uh, so when I came into the council, I literally hit the road running. I understood how city government worked. I understood, uh, you know, certain city agencies that were not pulling their weight and doing their part. Um, those were the city agencies that I needed to work um, um, work hardest with so that we can bring real positive change uh, to, to the community. And in the five and a half years that I've been in the council, I've approved over 7,000 units of 100% affordable housing, 5,000 of those units of brand new housing. Uh, I've been an advocate for homeless families, ensuring that we're building in, in, in the Bronx, but we're building responsibly and ensuring that homeless families uh, who are ready for independent living have access uh, to these units as well. Um, and I'm also, you know, the co-prime sponsor where um, Public Advocate Germani, where we passed a bill called the Racial Impact Study uh, for those developers that want to build, um, you know, over 50,000 square feet. Well, they need to provide the community with a plan as to how that development or how that project is going to affect that immediate community within the next 10 to 20 years. Um, so, the, I, you know, utilizing that experience and showing that I got my message out, I, I just want to state thank you to the constituents in the 17th Council District for believing in me and giving me another opportunity. You will be the most, obviously, the most senior member of uh, this Bronx delegation. How does that play? Um, does does how do you view that? Do you view it, um, you know, as, as kind of like a, a mentor or um, is there a role that you think you can play that's outside of, let's say, the traditional council member role? Because you uh, have been in for, for the longer than anybody else, one way or the other, uh, they'll all be new in all the other districts. Yeah, Gary, I'm utilizing my experience to help my, my colleagues uh, the, the ones that have won or like when Oswald won, I immediately reached out to Oswald and we sat down and we spoke about certain things that I've learned that helped me out and that I wanted to share with him. Um, and because I know what it is to be, be an incoming member, being a freshman and, and you know, and, and trying to, you know, learn the ropes. Uh, I've been meeting with all of my uh, all, all with I've, I've been meeting with all the, the Democratic uh, candidates that have won their primary, just giving them, you know, ideas as to you know, what's going to happen now with the speaker's race, or what's going to happen with the budget, what's going to happen with their district office, you know, just giving them my experience, and hopefully my experience will help them and make life much easier for them when they come into the council January 1st. Without picking on individuals and saying that I would support or not support, I think that we will all do better in the Bronx if we have a unified council delegation, so whatever the ideas are, those things you could push forward. Uh, Council Member Felice, um, you know, having won the special election, you were in office already. Any surprises for you? Has it been pretty much as you thought it would be? Or is there anything kind of, gee, I didn't realize that was going to be like this. Yeah, so I've been in government uh, for a pretty long time at every level of government, city, state, and federal. So I had a pretty good idea of uh, what it would be like. Uh, but I would say um, I came into office at a pretty, at a, in a very unique way, a, a special election. Uh, you take office immediately. You have to start getting a staff, reopen the office, um, and also right in the middle, right in the middle of budget season. Um, it was a lot, but it was a fun journey. And we're very proud of what we did during that period after winning the special election, including 
bringing uh, fifteen million dollars to my district in just uh, three months in office. Uh, money to bring uh, to uh, rebuild our parks, our schools, our housing, including public housing. Uh, so it's been a fun journey. You, you know, you could do the math: three three million in three weeks. You could multiply that by seventeen, and, and it, you know, <laughs> that would that would be uh, tremendous. And we're um, just getting warmed up, by the way. <laughs> um, one very quick policy thing: I saw that that you had gone into the old Fordham Library building, which has been empty for way too long. It's a gorgeous building. It's right in the middle of a very populated. Uh, community. Uh, do you have uh, ideas of what you'd like to see in there? I know that you're fielding ideas in the community. What are your thoughts about the old Fordham Library building? Yeah, many ideas. Uh, I know the city is going to be um, using the second floor for a civil service exam center. Uh, the Bronx doesn't have its own center, uh, so we're going to turn that into an exam center so that people can have uh, easy access to that. Um, but we still have a whole lot of space. That second floor is only about 30% of the space, we still have about 70%. We desperately need a community center so that people could have a space where they could express themselves politically. We could also house all the different nonprofits that are doing all the good work in our community. And we could you know, keep our community active. That area needs a lot of work in terms of getting organized. So community center would be the perfect organization uh, in that section. We will uh, keep an eye on that for sure. Uh, Council Member Salamanca, do you expect, I mean, realize this speaker uh, vote is is going to be coming up and they'll, we'll have a new speaker of the council. Do you expect uh, to be the land use chair again? Would you like to be the land use chair again? Because I know sometimes when the council flips, people uh, switch uh, committees. Uh, what are your thoughts about um, coming back and being a land use chair? No, I, um, I, I, I definitely want to remain in the position that I have as a land use chair. You know, I think that the Bronx has benefited uh, from having this, um, this chairmanship in the borough of the Bronx. But most, most, most importantly is the amount of development that's coming down to, to the borough of the Bronx, not just my district. You know, um, we, not too long ago, we voted on a project in Council Member Felice's uh, district that has to do with a hotel and some affordable housing that's being brought there. Uh, but you know, in my time as a council, I've learned how how, how applications move along. Uh, I've learned uh, how to properly negotiate uh, and ensuring that we're building responsibly, but that there's also a benefit. The community's benefiting uh, from this um, uh, from this development of this project. Uh, so I, I very much uh, first um, I'm working with my colleagues because we need to vote as a block in the Bronx so that we can pick the right speaker. And then once we pick the right speaker, then that's when we move forward and ensure that we get the chairmanships that we deserve so that we can move the borough of the Bronx forward. We only have a moment. Do you want to call out a name of somebody you're supporting or it's too early? Uh, it's too it's too early in the game. We got six months left. There's a lot of there's many good candidates right. uh, that are running and they're making their rounds. And it's their responsibility to convince their future colleagues that they they are the best choice for speaker. Council Member Felice in the 15th Council District, Council Member uh, Salamanca in the 17th Council District. Uh, if you are victorious in November, we hope you'll come back to Bronx Talk and we'll have a little more time to talk about all these issues. Congratulations on your primary win. Folks, when we come back, it'll be the 16th and the 18th. So uh, don't go away. More Bronx Talk in a moment.
Okay, back with you on Bronx Talk. And uh, so let's see, we did the 15th and the 17th Council District uh, Democratic primary winners. And now we're going to go to the 16th and 18th districts. So let's start at the 16th Council District, which you may or may not know, includes the Bronx neighborhoods of Claremont, Concourse, Concourse Village, Highbridge, Mars Heights, Mount Eden, and Marsania. And uh, Althea Stevens, congratulations on the primary win. You must be very pleased. Yes. Thank you so much. I'm very happy and I'm super happy to be here with you tonight. We appreciate uh, you joining us. And uh, then in the 18th Council District, which includes the Bronx neighborhoods of Soundview, Castle Hill, Parkchester, Clashen Point, and Harding Park, it is Amanda Farias. And nice to have you with us. Hey, Gary. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. Uh, Ms. Stevens, let's um, start with you. Um, why do you think um, the voters, now let's see, the numbers were 50.7, so you didn't have to go through that ranked choice process. Why do you think voters uh, supported your campaign to the point of 50.7%? Well, I think that the hard work that we put into the campaign, um, not only just during the campaign season, but even the work that I had been doing before around advocacy and youth development, really resonated with the people in the community. And also I felt like I brought something different as far as like how I was talking about some of the issues. And they were just really excited about supporting this campaign. Um, and I had always said that my opponents were gonna have to outwork me and we worked consistently hard, consistently was out there knocking doors, talking to people. And I think that on election night, those numbers proved that our hard work had truly paid off. There are many issues um, to talk about. If you are elected, we presume nothing. There will be Republican challengers. But if you are elected, among the dialogues will be the ranked choice voting process. Now, you didn't have to go through it. We're going to ask um, Ms. Farias about that as well. Um, but what did you think of the process? Did it work out for, you, for your constituents? Obviously, it adjustments, or we should throw it away. Well, we always need to adjustments, right? I think one of the things that for me around ranked choice voting that I think that we need to make sure that we're uplifting, there was some issues around voting already that we should have been addressing, like voter turnout, right? When you look at some of the Bronx numbers and it's in some districts, like in my district specifically, voter turnout was a lot lower than they had been in past years. Um, and I'm not necessarily saying that's going to count to ranked choice voting or whatever it is, but we already have really low turnout. And so for me, I think that instead of a lot of my teaching and, and outreach was around teaching people on ranked choice voting, but we didn't spend a lot of time trying to get people engaged, right? And so in the vein of always us saying like, oh, we have to be progressive and be the first, I think we also have to take a step back sometimes and look at well, what's already going on and is that working and how do we improve those systems before adding new ones to um, what we're already doing. Uh, Ms. Farias, let's um, talk with you about, uh, I guess, the same question. So the first part of that is, um, why do you think uh, voters chose you? Now, you went through the ranked choice voting process. This was a very competitive campaign. Uh, yeah. And then finally, at the end, you ended up with more than 50 percent. But let's just start with why do you think ultimately, and it wasn't a lot of, lot, lot of numbers, what did we say, 547? Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't it's a lot of uh, voter um, margin of victory. Why do you think you ended up with? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, I think the campaign that we've ran was uh, consistently talking to voters and, and, and meeting them where they were at on messaging, um, really being able to talk beyond just policy ideas, um, really, really meeting um, people with policy on solutions. Um, I think, you know, we had a really good balance on my campaign on not only talking about what I want to do in the city council, um, you know, come January, but we also, you know, were close to the ground. I was born and raised in this community. You know, I was fortunate to have a grandmother that lived in one neighborhood, but I also um, grew up in two of the other neighborhoods between, my, you know, being a child in my teenage years and I live in, in another one. So four of those neighborhoods, I've been able to have a pulse on the ground and really be able to answer those super local issues um, with with policy driven, solution minded uh, um, uh, results on how we were going to get there in the council. And, you know, truthfully, 
we were pounding the pavement every single day. Um, I had a strong team of people that were relatable and that were from the community and that understood um, that we were only going to be able to, to get the vote if we actually met people. Um, and we were data driven. We polled people, we surveyed, um, we really made sure that we were uh, talking about the things that people were telling us were their issues. Um, and, and you know, being data driven, being able to lead um, on, on local and citywide policy solutions. And also RCV education, I think is what really ultimately helped us get over the hump and have vic a victory in June. So just real quick then, um, your thoughts on, you used RCV, ranked choice voting. Um, you, you went through it, um, fair process, needs some tweaking. What are your thoughts? And let's do that briefly because I have some other things I want to Sure. Add. I definitely think we need to do some tweaks to it. Um, I was one of the you know, few candidates that actively had other partners for RCV education. And I think that was helpful in making sure people knew how to use it. Um, but you know, we really need to help folks better understand how it's implemented and why it's a moment of empowerment um, and utilizing their vote versus just another thing that we've added on. We really need to like focus in on, on the issues that we have. I have to say, I've asked every one of the uh, Democratic primary winners uh, in the city council in the Bronx, the same question and voter education Kept coming up, kept, you know, check that box, check that box. Um, let's just uh, talk about another thing that, that's happened. Um, we uh, just spoke with um, Council Member Salamanca is the only potentially, uh, assuming um, that uh, the Democrats, you know, hold serve and win in November, is the only real incumbent in this race, uh, in, in this um, uh, council. Um, and many other women here, two women who are being uh, elected to the city council. So acknowledging that, the new, the new voices, um, the, the new delegation, the emphasis on women, not only here, but throughout the city. How does that affect policy in the city council or how would you anticipate it will affect policy in the city council? Uh, Ms. Farias, that's for you first. Sure, uh, this is a great question. And I think ultimately policy is gonna move uh, relatively efficiently. And I think it's going to be really deliberate, intentional policy making that's coming up um, in the city. I think we all know the, the larger issues that are at hand. And I think with women uh, being able to lead the council right now, we're going to be able to see a lot of collaboration and a lot of intentional thinking um, to policy. You couldn't conceal your smile there every time. <laughs> we all noticed it. it's television and we all saw it. Um, Ms. Stevens, um, the same question for you. New council um, uh, with, with younger, uh, across the board, generally younger people, um, and also maybe an emphasis on women. Talk to me about the kind of either legislation or policy that you think will follow suit. Well, I think um, the beautiful thing about women, we often lead with our values and our morals, and we just always lead with a little bit more compassion because we're nurturers. Um, so I think that you'll see a lot more policy that reflect that, right? We'll see a lot more policy that reflects holistic addressing issues and not necessarily, you know, like trying to just hone in on things, but looking at how are we going to address the entirety, right? Um, so I think that those are things that women kind of just do a little bit better than men. Love you, Gary. Um, but <laughs> Thank you. I don't take it personally, but I do. Right. But, I, you know, I think <laughs> women often just lead in a very different way. Um, I like to say that we often lead with love um, and, and just a different and in, in, in a different energy. So for me, I'm really looking forward to working with this dynamic group of mostly women. You know, we have a majority in the council, which I think is lovely and beautiful. But I also think it's also going to be challenging because we have so it's such a diverse body. Right. And so everyone's going to come in with so many ideas and, and wanting to get so much done. Um, I think we really have to make sure that we're prioritizing and supporting each other through that process, which I think women do really well. Uh, you know, I'm going to just assert that things like paid family leave, uh, things that emphasize um, of families, keeping families together, providing supports for families, funding for these kinds of things are going to be on there. I don't want to assert it uh, for you, but I'm, I'm just going to uh, make that assessment. One thing that I've always, I've always think about because, and you both know because you debated on our program, um, we talk about issues. But one of the challenges for new council members is setting up an office, 
finding a process for constituent services and all that. So, um, Ms. Stevens, let's just um, ask you about that process, whether you're going to use the same office that Councilmember Gibson has used. Um, how do you see that playing out? How do you find a staff uh, that's competent and effective. You need people with legal advice, with political advice. Talk to me about that. And then uh, Ms. Farias will ask you the same question. So, I mean, a, a couple of things. So I think I'll start with staffing because I think that that's something that I do really well. And that's a transferable skill that I've already have, have done, right? Like I've been a manager of, you know, organizations and, and was able to build a staff. And I think that that's something that I do well. And even when you think about like your campaign team, you had to build a campaign around like your strengths, your weaknesses, the community and be reflective of those things. So to be honest, I think people who had successful campaigns already have some of those skills that I don't think that they already realize that they have. Um, and so for me, I, like I said, I've been doing, I've been in management for uh, quite a while. So for me, I know like where my deficits are. So for me, when I look for staff, I'm always looking to fill those deficits. And then also from being out in the community so much, really being able to have a reflective staff of the community and making sure it's as diverse as we can and really look like the district, I think is also important. But you get that when you're out in the community. I, I don't want to cut you off, but I've got to give Ms. Farias a chance to answer uh, the same question. Uh, let's just talk about um, uh, setting up a, uh, an office and a staff, et cetera. You got about 45 seconds to do it. Sure. I mean, just to piggyback off of what Althea was just saying, diversity really matters. We want to make sure the same way my campaign team was reflective of the community that that stays. I'm really excited to transition a bunch of the folks that already have relationships in the district that already have a presence into my staff. And for me, it's about finding a new space because we want it to be accessible to people and on a main roadway. So <laughs> I'm trying to see how we can do that. And I look forward to being as accessible as I can to our local constituency. One policy question, because parents are asking me, so it's either yes or no. Do you think that uh, the a DOE should give parents the option for remote education uh, as we go into the fall? So uh, Ms. Stevens, you first, your thoughts? Yes, no, not sure. Yes, Maybe. but I yeah. have more to say, but okay. <laughs> okay, and Ms. Farias. Yes, they should. Okay, well, there you go. Maybe that's an indication of how women will lean as we uh, go forward. Althea Stevens and uh, Amanda Farias, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, good luck in November. Again, uh, there will be Republican candidates. And I will tell you, next week, we've done all the primary winners. Vanessa Gibson of the Democratic primary winner uh, for um, a borough president will join us. And then the week after, we'll bring in some of the challengers. We'll bring in some of the Republican candidates and uh, you'll get to see all of them. So it's a little mini series we're doing. We thank, um, let's see, uh, Rafael Salamanca, Oswald Feliz, Althea Stevens, and Amanda Farias. And uh, guess what? We'll be here next week. And yes, uh, the candidate Vanessa Gibson will be our guest that night. So we'll see you all. Thanks to our producers, Stephen and Rebecca. 